to record it. So uh, Mrs. Lloyd, be aware that I will record this. Yes. I'm uh, and so it will be available on um, our own Canvas. Okay. Any questions before I introduce Mrs. Lloyd? Okay. So I'm going to share my screen and we, I've already emailed you guys some information about uh, Mrs. Lloyd, but we'll just very quickly have an introduction. Um, I actually met Mrs. Lloyd through a leadership program that we were both in at LSU. We were both participants one year um, and we've remained friends since then. Uh, but just some general background on Mrs. Lloyd. She was a journalist for many years uh, at the Washington Post. And now that she's retired from the news industry, she's a adjunct professor sometimes, and she is an author. So she most noteworthy, she is the author of Coming Full Circle, Jim Crow to Journalism. And she is working on another book, which she'll tell us about in a few minutes. And she is an editor and a former associate professor and former chair of the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications at Savannah State University in Savannah, Georgia. So now I am going to turn it over uh, to Mrs. Lloyd. Uh, and once again, we are very excited to have you here today. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And hello to all of you. I really admire all of you for foraging, for space, for working through the rain and through um, uh, quarantines and all that stuff that you're going through. I can't imagine how hard it, I cannot imagine how hard it is just to be a student these days. I'm delighted to speak to you today. I'm the um, author of Coming Full Circle from Jim Crow to Journalism, which is my memoir. It's the story of my life and my career in journalism. I was a newspaper editor for more than 40 years. I've worked at, at seven daily newspapers as an editor. And I have to tell you, I've never been a reporter. I always was an editor. And, and, and in my book, I sort of uh, walk readers through that journey of why I started as an editor and why I continue to be an editor and some of the successes and some, you know, disappointments and not becoming a reporter, but for the most part, successes in becoming, um, uh, becoming an editor. I started as a copy editor and worked my way through the different kinds of editing, section editing, uh, department editing, and then I was an administrative editor, which is a whole nother thing. And basically that's running a newsroom. So I learned a lot of business experience, a lot of leadership is in my background. And for the, and one of the things that I'm most proud of, and I, and I did a lot, was I helped the newspaper industry and other media companies um, build their capacity for newsroom diversity, mostly newsroom diversity, but diversity overall. That is making sure that newspapers and other, um, other kinds of media reflect the communities that they serve. Very important to do that. I thought the best way to sort of tell you a little bit about the book, and you see the cover of the book there, and I want to read a little bit from the preface of the book, and it kind of sets up um, my journey and what the book is about. So I'm going to do that now. Okay. I grew up in Savannah, just off the coast of Georgia, at a time when there were two societies, one black and one white. For every accommodation that existed for white people, there was a separate yet unequal accommodation for colored people or Negroes, as we were called at the time. It was long after I became an adult and moved away before I learned just how different those societies were. Ours was a community whose teachers had superior expectations for our academic success, even though they were forced to teach us in substandard facilities with hand-me-down books and furniture carted over from white schools, cementing in our minds the fact that we were considered second-class citizens. When I consider it, I am shaken by the reality that although I was born 84 years after slavery was legally abolished, the nation of my youth was still in a state of racial brokenness. brokenness. I, stood in, I stepped into adulthood crossing the bridge between full segregation and the civil rights movement. As a child, I attended some of the movement's mass meetings at churches in Savannah. 
Later, as a student at Spelman College, I heard Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. speak at a standing room only and spiritually rousing evening service at Mount Moriah Baptist Church. The civil rights movement left me appreciative of the, work, the right to worship God without fear of reprisal and to vote without fear of sanction and grateful for the five freedoms in the First Amendment. I have enjoyed the benefits of freedom of the press and have celebrated that I could go to any school or work in any place where I'm qualified to be. Somehow I made it into journalism despite growing up in a place where I didn't have African-American or female role models in the profession. Ultimately, I rose to a place in my career where I was able to address the lack of diversity and to help make the path easier for women and people of color to make their own difference through the stories they would tell or the newsrooms they would run. My journey is outlined here in this book with hopes that younger generations of women, African-Americans and others will be inspired to knock down walls and push through glass ceilings. It took more than 20 years to get far, as far away from Savannah's systematic oppression as I could, and it took about the same amount of time to figure out how to return and help make my hometown better. So this book is the story of a girl who grew up, me, of course, the girl who grew up in the Jim Crow era in the South, in a time when we were, everything was segregated in my life. Our schools, um, where we could live, the kinds of jobs we had or could have, how we shopped, very important. Um, and a lot of it was racial and quite frankly, because it was before the women's liber liberation movement, a lot of it was sexist as well. There were things that women were not expected to do and certain jobs that women would only hold. And so it was a really different time as I grew up, I learned that other people didn't live the way we, we were forced to live. And this is not a poor me story. I did not grow up poor. So, um, you know, don't get it twisted. I, my family, family was, I would say black middle class. And that means that we were in the middle class of the black community. We were not middle class in the total community, but my family owned businesses and um, were educated. I'm the third generation uh, a student at Spelman College. My grandmother and her sister were there at the turn of the century. That's the 20th century. My aunt who raised me was um, graduated from Spelman in 1936 and then I went to Spelman. So we were an educated family. So we had certain privileges, but we had privileges only to the extent that that segregation and Jim Crow laws would allow. So this book is the journey of a girl who went through this in Jim Crow, went to an HBCU, Spelman College, and then found herself, I found myself in an all white world in journalism. I entered newsrooms where I was the only many, many, many times. I was the only person of color in, the, in my first newsroom. I was one of only, I believe, two women in professional roles in my first newsroom. The other one was a reporter who covered, I think she covered religion. Um, and there were no other women on the copy desk where I was working. Um, I worked in seven newsrooms and those newsrooms are Providence Evening Bulletin in Rhode Island, the Miami Herald, the Atlanta Journal, the Washington Post, which is where I was the longest and longest is only 11 years. Um, USA Today where I became senior editor and one of the top editors in the newsroom. I was there for 10 years. So in the Washington DC area, a total of 21 years. And then I decided that I wanted to come back to the South. And so I um, asked for a transfer in the Gannett company. Gannett owns USA Today. And I went to the Greenville, South Carolina news, the Greenville news as managing editor. And then um, I left the newsroom for about four and a half years and went to Vanderbilt University and started a program, um, a journalism program on Vanderbilt's campus. They do not have journalism as an academic program on Vanderbilt's campus, but the Freedom Forum asked me to come and start a program which we called the Freedom Forum Diversity Institute. It's a program to train uh, people of color who are non-traditional students who had other careers and they want to change and become journalists. And we found them all over the country and brought them to, to Vanderbilt in Nashville and trained them in a, in a 
in a total immersive program over a 12 week period and sent them home to have uh, guaranteed jobs in their newsrooms. And then I went to my, I decided I, you know, I never really intended to leave the newsroom um, and so uh, permanently. And so I went back to the Gannett Company as executive editor of the Montgomery Advertiser in Montgomery, Alabama, where I was for almost nine years. And then I retired from the newspaper business and then came to Savannah, back to Savannah as um, chair of the department of mass communications at the time. And then we renamed it the Department of Journalism and Mass Communications. Um, soon after I came, I made sure that we um, went through that process. And so that's kind of the, the path that I was on. And this book talks about, it's got just many, many stories. One of the reviewers said, Wanda Lloyd tells um, hundreds of stories. I don't know, I never counted them. I asked my publisher, did you count them? Where'd they get that from? <laughs> he didn't count them, but there are, really a lot of little stories about what happened along the way as a journalist, as a person of color, as a woman who um, broke some barriers, as a person who cares deeply about the integrity of newsrooms and the integrity of journalism, journalism as someone who became a mentor to young people, still working with a lot of young people or younger people, anybody's young compared to me um, who's in the business. Um, people who um, wanted to ascend to leadership roles and especially women who want to ascend to leadership roles. So that's kind of my path and that's what the book is about. Okay, thank you for that great introduction. Sure. Um, I would just like to say that I love the cover and I also like your title. Um, what made you choose this particular photo for the cover? Okay, that's a great story. So you're seeing the cover there. Mm -hmm. So this is a 22-year-old Wanda Smalls mm -hmm. in the newsroom at the Providence Evening Bulletin. And this photo was taken for a little story that was going to appear in Ebony Magazine in 1972, I believe, a year after I um, went back to Providence. I went to Providence as an intern I went back to film and graduated. And then the next year I went back and worked in Providence for two years on the copy desk. And so this photo was taken for Ebony. And after the photo, um, the page was laid out, I had a friend who was an editor at Ebony, someone from Savannah. And he uh, asked me to sit for, you know, to send him the photo and he wanted to do this little story. And when the editors at Ebony saw the page, the layout on the page, they said, call her, ask her to come and interview here at Ebony. And so I did go to Ebony. I did get the job offer on the spot. I did, they didn't even let me walk out of the building without making, um, making an offer. That's and awesome. as a young person, I did something that I do not urge you young people to do. I accepted on the spot. And as soon as I walked out of the building and, and felt the hawk on North Michigan Avenue, mm -hmm. I went home and call my back to Providence and, and call my mother and I said, oh my God, I think I've made the biggest mistake in the world. I would love to work for Ebony Magazine, but I do not want to live in Chicago, which is where Ebony is located. <laughs> and then I said, how do I, how do I fix this? And so we talked about it and I, I called them back and asked them to um, accept my apology. Well, then they took my picture out of the magazine. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so the picture never ran. But I had, I had the hard copy picture. And as I was writing the book, one of the things that helps me in writing is to go back and look at things in my portfolio, you might say. So I have things all over my house and cabinets and drawers. And one of the things I had was a big book of bound newspapers. And that's a whole nother story. But inside this book were two or three photographs, hard copy, uh, glossy, eight by 10 photographs. And this picture was in there. And I sat there and I was like, why did I take this picture? And it, you know, it just brought back the memory. And also in there was the proof page of with the picture with an X through it that the editor had put on there. And my friend sent it to me. He said, well, you're not going to be in the magazine, but you know, congratulations on getting the offer. So I, I knew at that moment, and I was in the writing phase. I was in the early, I had just, my publisher had just accepted the book and I, and I sent it to the publisher and said, I think this is the cover. So that's, that's me. So if you look at that picture, and, and I wish I had um, put it on my desktop, the, the, the real photograph, because it's 
horizontal. So you see more of the background of the newsroom, but it shows the manual typewriter. Um, it shows the pneumatic tubes over my left shoulder. That's the way we used to get copy from the newsroom to the composing room. It shows a couple of, of one or two men, male editors, I guess, or journalists in the background. It shows the copy paper on the desk. If you can see the long strips of paper, that's how we edited stories. There were no computers, you know, so everything was manual. So that's where the picture came from. The coming full circle, when I came back to Savannah as the chair of the department, every time I turned around or thought about my past, I thought, man, I've come full circle. I really have come full circle. And I wasn't even writing the book yet. But I kept saying to myself, you have come full circle. You left Savannah, you did all these things, you had this wonderful career, all these great experiences, you traveled internationally, you've been to almost every state in the country, Wanda, and you really have come full circle. And because in the summer of 1969, as a junior in high school, I took a class on the campus of Savannah, a journalism class on the campus of Savannah State and for a, for a program for our high school journalists. And so to me, that was coming full circle to the campus. And so that's where the title came from. And then the, from Jim Crow to journalism, of course, just kind of happened because mm -hmm. I, I decided to tell the story of the Jim Crow and, um, and juxtapose that with my career. Okay, great. Um, so what made you want to become a journalist in the first place? And are there any other of your family members that have that are journalists? Um, no, my family thought I was crazy when I said I wanted to become a journalist. Because remember, this was in the 60s when I made the decision. I was a junior in high school. It was just before I went to that summer program at Savannah State. And I, t I remember um, I was in the kitchen at home and folks were doing whatever they do in the kitchen, preparing a meal. And I remember saying to anybody who would listen, I'm going to be a journalist. I want to be a, a newspaper journalist. And my grandmother looked at me and she said this, and remember this is 1969. She said, well, Wanda, I don't think a colored girl can be a daily newspaper journalist. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, that, that, that very statement just made me more determined to become a journalist. There were no people of color in journalism in Savannah, Georgia, in daily. We always had the black press, black newspapers, mm -hmm. and still do. But there were no people of color at the daily newspapers. There were no people of color on television, not even behind the scenes. And I, and I assumed not behind the scenes, but I have verified that, that there were no people of color. So I really had no role models in my family or elsewhere. I, my only role model was a high school teacher who, um, when I took a journalism class in 11th grade, and then I became the editor of the paper and took the second part of the class in the 12th grade, that's my only role model. And she had never set foot in a daily newspaper uh, herself. Mm -hmm. So um, she was teaching out of a book. Wow. Yeah. But that was enough to inspire you. Yes. So you said that you're a third generation Spelman graduate. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the occupations that you were exposed to? What did you see in your community? What were African-American women doing mm -hmm. at that time? Well, you know what? To, in the professional world, teaching was the top thing that African-American women were doing. I, I don't know of anyone who was, had a position more prestigious than being a teacher or a principal okay. with an African-American woman. Um, there were no executives. There were no, very few business owners who were women. I, I don't even know of a business owner, except my grandmother was a business owner. So I guess, I guess I do what know. What kind someone. of business did she? She own? was a cosmetologist, and she owned a school of cosmetology oh, okay. called Boyce's School of Beauty Culture. Oh, wow! And I didn't know until after we were going through some old papers after my mother died, and I found all these old papers. One of the papers had the letterhead from my grandmother's school. She was president, and my grandfather was vice president. And when I saw that, I was like, "You go, grandma! You <laughs> you made your husband the vice president." That is awesome. That, yeah. I love it. Yeah, and then the other the other occupation would have been nursing, but I had no no um, design to be anything scientific. So that I, that I counted that. And I really didn't want to be a teacher. In fact, my grandmother said to me that day when she said, 
that she didn't know any colored girls who had been a journalist. She also followed that up with, well, while you're in school, you better take some education courses because you need something to fall back on. And that said to me, she didn't really think I could make it. And she did not, she died right after I graduated from Spelman. So she was alive when I was an intern, but when I became a full-time professional, she was gone. Oh, sorry to hear that, but I know she's smiling mm -hmm. down on you. <laughs> Um, so for my uh, next question, what were some of the obstacles that you faced as an African-American woman um, and the only person of color in some of the newsrooms where you worked? Mm -hmm. You know, someone said to me, I guess I was at the Washington Post, someone actually asked me this question, what do you find harder, being a woman or being, a being an African-American? And I said at the time, and I think I still do, I really can't tell the difference because I can't separate those two things. Um, but there were many obstacles and there were obstacles. Some of them were when I became a leader, it was difficult for some men to see me sort of even running a meeting and they would talk over me or they would discount some of my ideas. And in the early part of my time at USA Today, when I was running those news meetings, the person, the editor who was above me, the executive editor would say, well, wait a minute, didn't Wanda have that idea five minutes ago? Or, well, wait a minute, let's get back to what Wanda just said. You know, because people would just sort of discount what I was saying. And it took a while for them to realize that not only did I have better ideas than most in the room because of my experience, but um, I had the power because of the title. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people would try to usurp that power. And then when I became an exec, a managing editor later in, in Greenville and Monk, Montgomery, I think because it was in the South, mm -hmm. there were people, people had difficulty sort of um, accepting me as a woman, I think, especially people from the community, not black people, of course, black people were very proud, but there were some white people in like, um, in Montgomery, I would, we had editorial board meetings and senators and members of Congress would come through town and because Montgomery is the capital, they would come back from Washington. And of course, everybody wanted to come to the editorial board meeting of the capital city newspaper because we could endorse them or we could help them with whatever their policy um, things were that they were trying to do with their legislation. And they would sit there and not talk to me. They would not look at me. They would look at other people in the room because I was the only person of color and most of the time the only woman in the room. And so, you know, I had to sort of learn how to sort of speak over everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so that became a challenge. Uh, the governor, dif very difficult situation. I mean, there were some people you could just tell they were uncomfortable mm -hmm. with the position that I was in. They didn't say so, but you really could tell from body language and from the fact that there wasn't all that much respect. Um, so what advice would you give a student today who's thinking about going into journalism with all of the layoffs and, um, you know, right now it seems like it's not a good time to go into journalism. What advice would you give? Well, I think um, the first thing I would say is that there are so many great opportunities in journalism. I am so proud of journalism. It's not, you know, obviously newspapers are passe and most of them, um, the companies are still there, but they're evolving and they're, you know, they're going digital first is, the, is the, the, the current term. Everything goes digital and then it might get into the newspaper. I'm experiencing that myself because I write a column occasionally for the, my local newspaper. And um, it was funny last week when the column was online, it went Thursday and then the, uh, the opinion page editor sent me a note. So, okay, your story's going to be in the paper Sunday. I'm like, everybody's already read it what's the point? <laughs> so, so this evolution is very interesting. And so the first thing, you know, just, just go with the flow, be flexible, love technology, absolutely love technology. Because you can do, you know, this whole time, there's a term called repurposing copy, you can, or repurposing content, I'm, so, I'm sorry, you can use it online, you can use it in a podcast, you can use it in a blog, you can use it in print, you can you know, slice and dice it. You know, I did a podcast for the local paper. I was interviewed and they took the slices of journalism out and turned it into a column. And they didn't even tell me. They just did a, like a Q&A and put it in the paper and said, this was in a podcast with Juan Deloitte. And, and so people were calling me saying, oh, I saw that 
Q and A, you know, what Q and A? Nobody told me, but they, you know, they own the content, and so you have so many opportunities to think about what it, you know. First of all, doing everything. There was a time when we would advise young people just, you know, figure out which direction you want to go in. You want to do print, or you want to do broadcast, you want to do PR, and do it well. No more of that. Everybody has to learn everything, and so I strongly urge you to do that. I love podcasts. Partly because, mostly because I can listen while I'm doing something else. I have a dog. I walk my dog twice a day. I can listen to the podcast because I've gotten to a point where I'm tired of listening to the news all the time. Yeah. And so podcasts are very educational and informative and I can pick and choose what I want. You know, people can listen to, listen to, read, look online at two, three o'clock in the morning. And so be very flexible and very um, um, aware that, that you have to update things constantly, mm -hmm. constantly. You know, don't, it never just sits there. So there are so many opportunities. And as far and the other thing I would say is, if you have an opportunity to take some business classes, please do because I would imagine that at least half of you will become entrepreneurs at one time in your life or another. Who knew after all these years I'm an entrepreneur because I'm promoting my book, I'm selling myself. So we, we all have to prepare to become entrepreneurs and, and run our own businesses and make our own income. Thank you. And I do. I love your website and I love the way you're packaging um, and selling yourself. So you're Thank doing you. a very good job. Thank uh, you. And, and I think that was how I ended up reconnecting with you is via an email that you sent out telling people about your book and that you're available to speak. So you're, you are doing a great job. Thank you. Um, which brings me to another question. Um, so you talk about from Jim Crow to journalism. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted you to kind of talk about the parallels between uh, what went on during the civil rights movement and what's going on right now in the Black Lives Matter movement. Do you see any parallels and how do you see that covered by the media? Okay. Well, I, I don't know if there are parallels, but I can tell you that, first of all, I was young during the civil rights movement, so I was not one of those folks out there marching mm -hmm. because I was in high school and it was just winding up when I went to college. Mm -hmm. um, I, I heard Dr. King speak in my freshman year, but the civil rights movement was pretty, pretty much winding down by then. Um, but one of the parallels is that it's young people. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love, you know. It was young people in the civil rights movement and it's young people now. One of the um, opportunities I had in Montgomery was to um, lead the coverage of the 50th anniversary of the Montgomery bus boycott. So we had a chance to really dig in and see what that boycott was all about and who led it and who are the people, who are the individuals and, and the strategies for the movement. And some of those strategies I think are carrying through today, things like nonviolence, and how, we tr how they train people to resist violence, resisting the police. Some of that probably needs to come back because we need to find a way to de-escalate some, some of the clashes we see between mm -hmm. the protesters uh, or between just people mm -hmm. and the police, not even protests, because clearly Mr. Blake was not protesting. He was just, whatever he was doing, it, it wasn't protesting, but he was shot in the back. Um, so that's, that's one, um, just understanding, I think, I think that's the biggest thing is the, the age of the people and the determination. I think the biggest difference in the movement is that the civil rights movement, while there were white people in the movement, many more, I see many more white people protesting today. There were white people in the background of the civil rights movement, people who were raising money people who were doing some of the training. Quite frankly, some of the ministers, the white ministers were very supportive. Mm -hmm. um, many of the lawyers were white. Now, just everyday people who have joined this movement, they're marching with the Black Lives Matter movement. They are voicing their discontent. Also women, I think, are out front more this time before the women were in the background. There was sexism in the civil rights movement. Now, women are, young women are out front. I see them speaking at every rally. There are young women who are speaking and taking leadership roles. Look who, it wasn't that, I think it was a woman who started um, 
Black, Black Lives, Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. That's so true. They, yeah. So my next question, of course, we have to ask something about COVID-19. Mm -hmm. How do you think um, the pandemic has changed the way we report news and newsrooms, the makeup of newsrooms? Uh, how has COVID-19 changed the way we report news today? Let me just say this. A lot of newsrooms, news, news, let me just start with newspapers. Newspapers are selling their buildings because they were too big, because they've downsized so much, they found that they really don't need these big buildings. Mm -hmm. But they've been developing and building these little um, newsrooms downtown, the same location, just smaller. Mm -hmm. um, now there's nobody in the newsroom at all because they're all working from home. And they have discovered that they can do the same job without having people in the building. Now, we lose a lot in that because there's nothing like being in a newsroom and working off the energy of everybody in the newsroom. I can't tell you what a pleasure it was for me to walk out of my office and spend time just sitting, walking around and sitting, you know, hanging out with the reporters and say, what are you working on today? Well, how can I help you with this? Well, maybe have you thought about this angle? Have you thought about talking? Oh, I know somebody who can help you. That doesn't go on anymore because people don't know each other, especially new people. As you young people move into your various places of business, I really think that this pandemic is going to change the way we work permanently. Mm -hmm. I think we have found out that we, can, we the media, can do just an, as effective a job working independently working from home. And you know, a few years ago, there was this term called backpack journalism, where we were trying to force young, not young, all, all journalists to, to we would literally give them a backpack and say, here's your camera, here's your tripod, here's your lights, here's your pad and pen, here's your laptop, here's your tablet, here's your iPhone. The net company bought an iPhone for every journalist in the, in the entire company before wow. I left. It's so that we would take photograph, um, photos and video and trained everybody on how to edit video, newspaper journalists, as well as everybody else. And so this whole, this whole notion of backpack journalism was prevalent. Now we're back to backpack journalism. It may not be called that, but everybody has their own little workspace. And we are finding that we can work anywhere. We can work, I'm in my dining room. I'm, I'm zooming from my dining room, but I have my desk in the sunroom. Journalists are doing that all the time. You know, we're all enjoying the backgrounds of people that you see interviewed on TV or, are interviewed in some of these Zoom sessions of any kind. Television stations just, just before COVID were spending zillions of dollars redesigning their, their studios mm -hmm. to increase technology and to have greater, greater you know, environment in the studio. Look at you, You're, you just you know, did your own backdrop on Zoom. Yes. It didn't cost you millions of dollars to do that. And so now the TV stations have figured out that they don't really need their journalists in the, in the studio. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. And they don't need to have, the, I don't know, these, these studios are just going to, I don't know, they're just going to be there because I think now that this is going to be a permanent change. And a lot of you who are aspiring to journalism will be doing things independently and you'll be working from the Starbucks or wherever you can get Wi-Fi or from home. So I think it's gonna change the mindset after we get out of COVID. During COVID, we're gonna do what's happening now, but I really think we're never gonna go back to where we were in terms of how we work. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is my final question and then we will take some questions from the students. Mm -hmm. What's next on your agenda? Do you have any big plans for another book? Yes, and I do want to hear questions from students, so I hope we have time, so I'll try to make it quick. I'm working on a, on a book project with one of my best friends. Her name is Tina McElroy Ansa. She's oh. a, a celebrated and best-selling and award-winning author of five novels. Yeah. She, was my, she was my freshman year roommate at, roommate at Spelman College. She started in journalism also, and then she veered off to become a novelist. We're working on a, pro, a book called Meeting at the Table, African-American Women Write on Race, Culture, and Community. It is an anthology. We have asked um, some amazing women to write essays for this book. And so I spend all my evenings editing these essays on Zoom with them, on phone with them, talking about their stories and helping them to craft their stories. Um, we, 
recognized after George Floyd's death that a lot of people had a lot of questions. What's going on here? What's, why, why did we, did we miss this? It almost harkened back to 1968 and the Kerner Commission report. The Kerner Commission was a report that was commissioned by President Lyndon Johnson. And the commission was asked to figure out why did people um, after the death of Martin Luther King, why did they burn their cities? Why were they angry? Why did they protest? Why did they march? And the Kerner Commission said the media is largely responsible for this chasm, this difference in opinion, this difference in the knowledge of black people and white people, because the media was not reporting on it. And that's a matter of accuracy or inaccuracy. Um, the same thing is happening right now where a lot of people especially people who are not African-American, do not understand how this came up. They don't understand why some of this, um, some of it's political. I'm just going to put it out there. Some of it is political. Well, a lot of it is people feeling disenfranchised and people feeling like privilege is mine. And, and these two cultures are clashing. And so Tina and I said, you know, we need to do something about this by writing about it. Let's do what we do best. You know, we're too old. We're not going to get out there and march. We're not, we got COVID, so we, you know, we're in that class of people who are, you know, we're not supposed to leave the house. So we're doing what we do best. We're putting, we're, we're co-editing this book. We're having, and it just so happens that my friend Tina in 2008, seven or eight, launched her own publishing company called Down South Press. So she's publishing the book and it's going to be out in November. So that is exciting. And I have to tell you that I have read several of her books. I think The Hand I Fan With, or right. I, I read all of her books uh, several years ago. So when I saw that she wrote your forward, I was very excited about yeah, it. She, she wrote the forward to my book. Absolutely. Yeah, that is amazing. She is very, very well known. Um, so that ends my questioning period. And now I'm going to uh, open it up to the students to see if they have any questions which I'm sure they do. <laughs> Great. I have a question. Hey, Tyler. Can um, you put us on speaker view so I can see all the questioners? Is that possible? Yeah, can you see the, can you see them now on my screen? I see, it's, well, mine's a gal, galley. Yeah, so do you see all of the students now? I only see, I only see uh, three students and you and me. Oh, okay, well, let me. Okay, see. that's good, perfect. Okay, okay. Great. thank you. You're welcome. Um, what was your experience like getting to listen to Dr. King speak? Um, it was overwhelming, and it was in a ch it was in Mount Moriah Baptist Church, which is a pretty good sized church. It's not huge, huge. Well, it's a probably not even there anymore. Um, but it was standing room only. There were people. It was packed, and I don't. If they had air conditioning, there were so many people in there that it didn't feel like they had air conditioning. Um, so we, it was very hot and steamy, but people were um, um, animated, you know, it was a rousing ser ser sermon. And, you know, we got all dressed up because this, remember, this was 1967. So everybody got dressed up, literally got put on our Sunday best on like a Saturday afternoon to go see Dr. King. The most um, amazing thing for me came in 2000 when I moved to Montgomery and I was asked to be the Sunday speaker at Dexter King Memorial Baptist Church. And so I got to speak in the church that Dr. King pastored. And when I went into the church, they said, well, we're going to take you downstairs to, to the pastor study. And I literally sat at the desk that Martin Luther King used to, to write his own sermons. And then when I went upstairs, I literally was the speaker in behind the podium that Dr. King spoke behind. So from Mount Moriah Baptist Church in 1967 to 2000 and September 2004. Um, that was quite an emotional time for me. That is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Mm -hmm. I had a question as well. Yes. Uh, bear with me. I'm trying to figure out how to ask this, but you said you were often the uh, only person of color or, and or the only woman in the room. Mm -hmm. um, how did you, you, balance um, being able to fit in and being able to be accepted in that room while also preserving, you know, your heritage and the fact that you're a woman. Like, I know it's very easy 
to fall into the default whenever you want to be accepted as a, you know, yeah, um, yeah. as a person in your field. But how did you kind of, you know, battle with that of, you know, being, being a proud African American and being also a woman in a time where that was the differentiating part about you? Well, in the early part of my career, right after I got out of Spelman, this was the first time I had ever been in a full-time situation with white people. I had grown up in the Deep South in a segregated society, and then I went to an HBCU. And so for all of a sudden, I was sitting on a copy desk with all these white people and in a newsroom with all these white people. I was scared to death. I was quiet, I was shy, I was scared. I didn't know what to say. I didn't understand their culture. They didn't understand my culture. So I, to be honest, for the first few years of my career, I was not engaged. I was just listening. When they would sit around the copy desk and there's downtown, downtime on copy desk, they would talk about you know books they were reading or what they had for dinner last week or the movies they were watching, all the cultural things. And I didn't know what they were talking about because I had not read those books. I was an English major, so I'd read the classics. But you know, when you're in the copy desk, you're not talking about Chaucer and Emily Dickinson. <laughs> you're talking about the trashy books you're reading. I, I had not necessarily trashy, but books by the authors that you care about. They had never heard of the books I was familiar with, and I had never heard of the books they were reading. They, had, they were talking about... Uh, really cultural things because Providence is a town that has a lot of Polish and Italians. And so I had never been exposed to the kinds of meals they were eating and the kinds of sayings that they had in their families and their accent was different. My accent was different. And so it was very difficult. When I became an editor at USA Today, actually at the Washington Post to some extent, um, I had to really fight my fight within myself to speak up more and to be more assertive and to understand the value of, of me being there. My value is when you're working on a story that has to do with something that I know a little bit more about than you, I really need to speak up. That's my responsibility. And that came to me very quickly. So, so you know, like um, in a small community, I remember taking my staff in Greenville on a tour of West Greenville because I realized that while I was managing editor that they didn't know anything about the black community. They thought everything on, in West Greenville was bad. And I, I rented a bus literally and hired a historian in the community to say, okay, this is a community that's rich with stories and people who care about their community and they want to educate their children and do better and be better. And so it took me a while to get to that point where I could assert myself as who I am, bring my whole self to the table. Great. Any other questions? I have a question. Um, similar to Cody's question, I guess, uh, as being the only woman a lot of times in the room, what advice would you have for women moving forward of, you know, it, we're, sometimes we're either seen as too assertive or not assertive mm -hmm. enough, or, and like finding a balance between those things of how to bring your ideas to the table and not be afraid of them. But, you know, sadly, I think that there still is sexism in, in some workplaces. Right. How to approach that? Let me let me frame that in the in the way someone helped me with it. So I I have a, a former colleague, an African American woman at USA Today, who would do a lot of speaking to the staff, or she would do public addresses in journalism. And I walked up to her one day and said, "How did you get to the point where you can really talk like this? You can just stand up and talk." And she said, "The first thing you have to remember is that when you're in the room, and if, if most of the, many, much of the time." you know more about what you're talking about than anybody else in the room. If you have something to say, it's because you really know about it. And so let's just say there's a story about health disparities. And because you're a woman, you realize that there are some things that women are aware of, you know, you know not to be sexist, but breast cancer, ovarian cancer, um, postpartum depression, whatever it is that only women go through, that the men in the room really don't know enough about. And so you really need to bring your whole self to the, to the conversation and say, well, yeah, but look at this statistic or look at this source for the story. So bring your whole self to the conversation based on who you are and what you are. Now, that's not to limit you to only stories about women or conversations about women. So you really have to get comfortable, again, just speaking up. You will get pushed aside from time to time. I guarantee that will happen but you won't get pushed aside as much once you get used to putting yourself out there. And at some point you're gonna gain enough strength and confidence in yourself to say, shut up, I'm talking. 
I've got something to say. And when you become a boss, you really are going to learn how to say, listen to me because, you know, don't say it in these words, but I'm the voice of authority because quite frankly, and I never said this to anyone, I sign your paycheck or, you know, I make your assignments. I decide, you know, what shift you're going to work or what stories you're going to get or what assignment, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it really comes with age and experience, but, but you will get there. But just, you know, you do have to sort of force yourself. I'm not the best example of that when I was your age, but it really grew on me. And also remember, I went to an all-girls school. Spelman College is all women. And so in terms of leadership, everybody, every leadership position was a woman. You know, the head of the Student Government Association was always a woman. The editor of the newspaper and the yearbook was always a woman. The head of the, I don't know, the sociology club or the fridge club or whatever it is, was always a woman. So we learned leadership at an early age. We learned how to run a meeting because we had to, because there was no man to run a meeting. And so I came out with that kind of confidence when I got out of Spelman because I had been a leader in several, um, and in high school also in several instances. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Okay. Any other? Okay, Carrie. You mute it. You mute it. No, she's not. Not now, but something is going on. I think frozen might be the best way. Okay, there you go. Yeah, we still can't hear Okay, you. okay. It's my it's my Bluetooth. Okay. I was playing you through my Bluetooth so I didn't strike my frame. But um what has been um either the in your tenure in your career as a journalist, what has been, especially with you working in the newsroom, the most controversial topic or the most um loved topic or or a, a narrative or some kind of headline that you enjoy covering or you enjoy publishing so mm -hmm. hmm. well i will say okay i do have an example in this and it's a story about a woman about women um when i was in montgomery we ran a story a, a very short story about a woman who was killed by her husband. She was a 50 some year old woman. She was a newlywed second marriage. She had um, met this man in anyway, she something happened. It was a very short relationship before she married him. And he killed her uh, shortly after they were married. And so this little story and, and, I, and uh, the reporter wrote some kind of brief. So and so was found dead in her home or car, wherever it was. And, and this the day that the story ran, I got a phone call from a woman who was the director of a women's sh of a shelter, a family shelter in, in Montgomery. And she said, Mrs. Lloyd, I just want to talk to you about this story that you had because this woman was not on our radar. We, we think that, we hope that most people who are going through um, abuse, domestic abuse, are reaching out to us because we have all kinds of services for them, but we didn't even know about this woman. What can the newspaper do to help? And so in this conversation of about an hour, I suggested that the newspaper take the leadership and put together a roundtable discussion of all the stakeholders in the community who are in the media and also deal with um, domestic abuse. And we pulled this roundtable together. We hosted it in the newspaper community room. We did, it was all day. We brought in lunch. We brought in speakers. We had the police chief, um, heads of hospitals, all the media, cable TV, magazines, advertising agencies, newspapers, all the television stations, radio stations. And we had um, people from domestic abuse um, businesses, whatever those might be, and services, I guess is the better way to put it. And we came up with the idea to do a month long series of communication stories, whatever you want to call it, about domestic abuse and, and the opportunities to help people in the community. And each of the media organizations took a, said, we'll take a week and we'll do something. So in our week, and uh, we did in October because it's Domestic Abuse Month, um, in our week, we ran a series of stories about domestic abuse and about this woman in it. And we interviewed, we went to, we had a reporter go to a prison and interviewed a, um, a support group who 
people who had been convicted of abuse and they were sitting around a room, you know, with a psychologist trying to figure out how to, you know, improve themselves. We, we, we interviewed uh, all the stakeholders and the day after the first story ran, this woman, Mrs. Sellers is her name, called me and said that they had had a more than 25% increase in the number of calls that came to their hotline after the very first day of stories. And so to me, that's a lasting impact that I could see tangibly that helped the community because we made people much more. There were billboards, you know, those digital billboards, di billboards all over town, something like domestic abuse, new, need help, question mark, called, you know, 800-5555. That's how we help people. And so to me, that was um, something that was really mem memorable um, in my career. Not to mention all the football stories we had to do in Alabama, because we always had a winning team. That's awesome. It's yeah. wonderful when you can actually make a difference. Yeah. yeah. I know you've probably interviewed a lot of famous people. Who would you say is the most famous person that you've ever interviewed? Well, I would say I've met a lot of famous people. Um, again, remember, I'm not a reporter. So That's true. You're an editor. Yeah. So that's not been something, I mean, we've had people come to, um, into our editorial board meetings at USA Today and in, in Montgomery and Greenville. Um, so, you know, all the, I've met most of the presidents in my lifetime, except Barack Obama and Donald uh -huh. Trump. So I did, because I had, he, he became president, I guess, just, you know, he, well, it was 2008, I retired in, 2013. And so I never had an opportunity to meet Barack Obama, but I have pictures in the book with Clinton and Bush and some vice presidents. Um, up, the governors of every state that I worked in, of course, would come into the newsroom and I would sit in the editorial board meetings with them. Um, so those, you know, those are some people that I remember. There's a story in the book about Hillary Clinton when she came to the American Society of Newspaper Editors to speak and I got to ask her a question. And the question I asked her way, she was a senator actually from New York. And I asked her after her speech and I was scared to death. It was the first time I'd ever gotten up in that, in the room was full of like maybe 1500 people. And I asked her if she would ever run for president. And of course she said, no, she said, I'm really you know, committed to serving the people of New York, which is what I expected her to say. But I believe, and I think I've documented this pretty well, that I'm the first journalist ever to ask her if she'd run for president in a public setting. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Okay, any other questions? I have another one. So were you at, did you work for USA Today like from the beginning, kind of when the USA Today changed the way we report the news, because I think people, they talk, they call it the USA Today style of writing, right. where you have these chunks and, you know, it's broken up. You don't have these long drawn out stories. So it's interesting. I, I, I had to revisit that yesterday because I recorded a session that's going to be um, a, a, a virtual program that's going to air on September 15th, which is the 38th anniversary of USA Today, September 15th, 1982 was the launch date. And I always remember that date because they asked me to come work at USA Today before it launched. And I was pregnant at the time. Oh. And so I couldn't figure out how to make that transition in the middle of a pregnancy with insurance and all that stuff. So I did not go as one of what they call the founders, mm -hmm. but I did go four years later to USA okay. Today. Um, and there were a lot of naysayers about USA Today because of the short stories and because of all the, the splashy color and the graphics, the info graphics. And a lot of the traditional news people, uh, journalists were naysayers about whether USA Today could even last. One of the biggest naysayers was um, Ben Bradley, who was the editor of the Washington Post. He was the editor that took them through the Watergate era and the Pentagon Papers and all that. And when I went into his office and told him I was leaving, you know, his attitude was something like, well, how's that going to work out for you? You know, I think he figured that someday soon I'd be coming back, knocking on the door saying, can I come back to the Washington Post? Yeah. I never looked back because I was, you know, I was fairly young. I was in my um, maybe late thirties at the time. And I, I kind of 
felt comfortable with the changes that newspapers were going through, the technology changes. But I love the short stories. I love the, the, the color. And I thought this is really, I, I see this as an opportunity. I see this as the future. And so I had to relearn journalism because USA Today was so different. And I didn't realize that until I got there. I mean, I knew it was different, but I didn't realize how much of a learning curve it was going to be. So I had to learn how to pack a lot of information into a, a small amount of space as an editor, because I was a line editor in my first job. I went there as deputy managing editor for cover stories. And then a year later, I was promoted to managing editor for newsroom administration. And then three years later, senior editor for administration and then news like I ran the newsroom after about four years when I went to USA Today on a daily basis. Um, so there was a lot of learning. I had to learn how to um, how to crop pictures in a different way. I had to learn about the how much USA Today and the Gannett Company care about diversity. Mm -hmm. And one of the rules, and I don't know if you've heard this or seen this, and I don't even know if they still do it. I, I really don't read the print edition anymore. I read the online. But we had a rule that every day above the fold, there had to be an image of a woman and a person of color. Because oh. that newspaper was sold in the box. You know, those iconic white boxes that you used to see. And we knew that people made a decision by looking at the front page as they were passing it in the airport or looking at it on a counter in a hotel or in a convenience store. And the message that we wanted to send had to be above the fold. And that message was diversity. And it had to be a positive story. Now, there could be some negative stories about women or pe people of color. Somebody got arrested, O.J. Simpson, for example. But that was not the, that didn't count for the positive story of the day above the fold. And so it, it could be a person. And, and then we had to think inside diversity. You know, it wasn't all African-American. It had to be Asian-American. Um, Hispanic, Native American, had to be women and women of different color colors. So a lot of the diversity sometimes fell to sports because that's where most of the diversity was at the time. But for women, we really had, that meant we had to have diverse stories inside the newspaper in order to promote them on the cover of the paper. So that was a whole new learning curve for me. And I loved it. I absolutely loved it. Definitely revolutionized the news industry. Yeah. Uh, what's, how much time do we have? Because I have a story I want to tell. Okay. We have 15 minutes left. Okay. Well, I want to tell a story. One of the stories is about O.J. Simpson. I'm not going to read it, but I'm going to tell it quickly. Okay. So when O.J. Simpson was, um, um, the trial was going on. We called it the trial of the century. Y'all know the story of O.J. Simpson? Mm -hmm. he Love don't fit. accused of killing his wife and, or his former wife and her friend. Um, so he was, um, we, we covered this trial forever. And the day that I was in my office on the 15th floor, which had sports and money. And um, I went down when it was announced that the, the trial, the, the verdict was coming through. I went down to the news part of the newsroom because I wanted to be in the news part when we were all watching TV and there were TVs all around the room. And as I listened to the verdicts, I heard the first verdict said not guilty. And I heard over here somewhere, somebody crying. I heard people sniffing. And I didn't, I just kept my eyes straight on the TV. I didn't want to turn around because I didn't know what that was all about. And then when the second verdict came not guilty, I heard some people on the other side of the room sniffing. And when I finally looked around, there were young white women who were upset about the verdict. And we didn't anticipate in the newsroom that young white women were feeling like the death of Nicole Brown Simpson was not, um, not her life was not valued because OJ Simpson got, Simpson got out. So instead of talking about it and addressing that issue, I went back to my office and as soon as I sat down at my desk and my back was to the door because I was on my computer. I felt the presence of someone coming in my office and there was an African-American person, one of the staff members, and then another, and then another, and then another. And all of a sudden all black people in the newsroom were in my office and somebody slammed the door and we did, I guess, a virtual high five. We were all celebrating and we had to think about, well, why were we celebrating and why were there people who were in pain in the newsroom? who were not happy about this verdict. And the truth of the matter is, 
we had never seen a situation where a black person had gotten off, not because they were not guilty, because we all think thought he was guilty and still do, but that because he had enough money and could hire the best attorneys, all of a sudden, you know, he got the justice he deserved. And we've never seen a black person do that. And so we had to have conversations in our newsroom. We actually brought in a facilitator to talk to us about why we were so surprised at each other in the way we were thinking about this. But it also led us to do stories about it because we reported in throughout the country the fact that there was this chasm in the community between black and white folks, especially young white women. And we and it actually turned into stories. So that was the, the good news about that. So I want to read um, a really short piece. Um, I this is this is what I call my Atlanta story. So I had a, um, a fellowship money from the Atlanta newspapers uh, in the name of Ralph McGill. Ralph McGill was the, I, the editor of the Atlanta papers during the civil rights movement. And he wrote these courageous editorials supporting civil rights, white, white editor. And um, he took a lot of hits for that in the Atlanta community because this is still the South. And so um, I was very honored to get one of the first Ralph McGill fellowships. And it was for students who were from the South with the hopes that the support of this money would encourage them to stay in the South and, and do journalism in the South and make the South better. Um, and so um, I had been to Providence for the summer in between my junior and senior year and, and an internship. And then I came back and of course I had to find a job. So I always thought, well, you know, they want me to, to work in the South. I'm just gonna go to the Atlanta paper and say, I need a job, I'm ready for a job. Can I have a job? And so this is the story about that. I made an appointment with William Bill Fields, an editor who served in various roles at the Atlanta newspapers. It was Fields who reached out to let me know I was a recipient of a Ralph McGill fellowship in my junior year at Spelman. Like many young people, I was not focused on who he was at the time, but I remember he was a nice gentleman who seemed to want me to do well. I think I met him on campus when he came to speak to one of our journalism classes. By the time I was ready to meet, meet Fields, in, Fields in his office on Marietta Street in downtown Atlanta, he was vice president, an executive editor of the morning and evening Atlanta newspapers. I was ready to show him my updated resume and have a conversation about my successful internship experience at Temple University and at the Providence Evening Bulletin. Come in, sit down, Phil said, graciously motioning me to a chair. What's on your mind? I handed him my resume and I told him as quickly as I could about all the good opportunities I had in journalism. I told him I was editor of the Spelman Spotlight and I shared my summer accomplishments in Providence. I told him I was from Savannah, but I had no desire to return home to work for the local newspapers there. I want to stay in Atlanta, I said, and work for the Constitution or the Journal. Mr. Fields listened intently as he studied my resume. Well, we invested in your education with the fellowship and we would be happy to have you working here as a reporter. Did he just say reporter? Thank you, I said, but I'm a copy editor. I want to work as a copy editor, not as a reporter. During my internship in Providence, I had come to love copy editing. I'd been a reporter for student publications, but what really gave me pleasure was to get my hands on stories and make them better. To work with reporters, photographers, and other editors, and to lay out pages that would be appealing to readers. Besides, I was shy at that time in my life and not comfortable going out and talking to strangers, which a reporter has to do. No, I was a copy editor and no one was gonna talk me out of being one. Also during my internship, I was told by one of my colleagues that copy editors make slightly more money than reporters and copy editors get to management faster. I was a copy editor. Fields went on to tell me how important it was for the Atlanta newspapers to hire Negroes as reporters. We were still living in that period of the civil rights movement and black people in Atlanta were demanding that the newspapers hire journalists who could help improve the accuracy of reporting and writing about what was going on in the community. The reality was that newspapers were struggling to find what they called at the time qualified Negroes to work in the nation's daily newspaper newsrooms. Why can't I work on the copy desk, I asked Fields. Look, you can come work here tomorrow if you want as a reporter, but if we put you on the copy desk, working inside the building, 
No one, black readers presumably, will know you are here. I thanked him for the conversation and the offer. I returned to campus and placed a long distance call on the payphone in my dorm to Joanne Garrell, the managing editor in Providence. Joe had offered me a job at the end of my internship. Joe, if the offer is still open, I'd like to come back to work on the copy desk as soon as I graduate. And that's how I got to, back to Providence for the two years after I graduated. That's, that's a great story. So you stood your ground. I did. Yeah, did what you wanted to do, not what was expected of you. Exactly. Never regretted it. And I ended up going back to the Atlanta papers for a short time in um, like 2000 and, I'm sorry, 1990, uh, gosh, my years, 1974. Mm -hmm. As a copy editor. That's right. Let me just say this, it was the worst job I ever had. <laughs> How long did you do that job? Six months. Okay, any other questions? No? Well, let's give Mrs. Lloyd a hand and thank her for joining us. Thank, thank you. you so much for joining us. Before you go, we'd like to get a photo with you, if you okay. don't mind. We'll do okay. a screenshot and I'll share it and I'll tag you. Okay. Okay, are you guys ready? On the count of three. One, two, three. I'll take one more. One, two, three. Okay. Thank you again. And we really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to meet, to meet with us today. Thank you. And I hope that my stories inspire some of you as you are planning your journey. And um, I also look forward to some of you reading my book, but also reading the book that's coming out in, since you're in the class with about women in the media. Hey. Um, I, I look forward to getting some feedback on that as well. So, thank okay, you. I look forward to having you back yeah. as you speak in future well, with, with Tina, since you've yeah. read Oh, wow. That would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> We're looking forward to doing that together. Okay. Well, thank you. And we will see you later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And uh, we'll stay on for the last few minutes of class. Okay. Uh, with I'm the students. Sure. I'll stay with the students. Okay. I got you. All right, what did you guys think? Did y'all enjoy that? It was very interesting. Um, so before we um, adjourn, let's just talk about what's coming up and what's due um, this week. Uh, make sure that you submit your research paper topic. Some of you have already done that, but a few of you have not. Um, and I think you all are able to see the other research paper topics and the other teams, uh, just to make sure that there's not any overlap. Uh, try to write about something that uh, other people are not writing about. Uh, but this is, can you all see my screen? Can y'all see this? Oh, you can't? Okay, let me share it. Okay, now you can see it. Can y'all see Canvas now? Okay, so um, make sure you share your research paper topic. Uh, the, it's due September 3rd at, by midnight, um, and that's today. So make sure you do it by midnight today. If you have any questions about your research paper topic, feel free to email me or call me. Uh, you do have my cell phone number. If you have, if you wanna, if you're thinking about a couple of ideas and you'd like to talk to me about it to find out what would be the best route, feel free to do that. I also wanted to say that you guys are doing a great job on your discussions. Um, our discussion board leaders have been posting some good questions and uh, you all have been responding. So thank you for that. Keep up the good work. I wanted to let you know um, how that particular assignment is graded. Uh, the three in the team members who post questions, not only are you graded for sharing your questions, but you're also graded for uh, providing feedback to your classmates. So we have 15 people in the class and we have three people on the teams so when you think about that, you should respond to at least five people in our class. You can, of course, respond to more. 
but when I when I'm grading the assignment, that's what I, I look at. So if you if you received a low grade or if I took off points, that's why, because you didn't actually respond to the post. Do you guys have any questions about that? I don't think we have any next week. Um, next week you have some other types of assignments that you have another assignment that you'll work on as a group next week. Uh, so you won't have the discussion board. But let's take a look at the module uh, for this week. So we're now on week two. So for this week, you need to, today uh, or on Tuesday, we talked about chapters one and two. Um, I noticed that several of you, or most of you have taken the chapter one test, uh, but make sure you take both, both of those tests, both of those quizzes, uh, because they're, I think they will end maybe today at midnight, uh, and then they'll be past due. Um, and then today, of course, we have the speaker, Wanda Lloyd, um, and then you have a blog entry that's due over Wanda Lloyd's talk. Uh, the About Me video that's due on September 8th, we've already talked about that. Uh, if you have any questions about the About Me video, let me know. Uh, if you want to look at some examples, go back to uh, the module and there are, go back to the PowerPoint presentation that was presented on Tuesday. Um, and then on the first few pages, you'll see that there's a link to About Me videos that have been turned in previous semesters. Um, and then also again, once again, make sure that you complete the quizzes over chapters one and two. So that's for this week. And let's take a look at what's coming up next week so you guys can prepare. So um, next week on Tuesday, uh, you will pre present your About Me video. Uh, and then for the rest of the week, we are going to talk about free speech versus hate speech. Uh, this is an assignment that you will work on with your, your team, with your group. So there are three readings that I want you guys to do. And then after you read those, so one is actually a PowerPoint presentation and the other two are articles. And so after you've completed those readings, then you will complete the free speech versus hate speech assignment. And you will com complete that with your team. Your, your team. Uh, and on Thursday, we will not meet, but you all will look at the chapter presentations on PowerPoint, and then you will read the chapters, of course, and you will have two quizzes to complete on Thursday. Okay. So do you all have any questions or concerns about what's coming up and what's due? Um, yes. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, Cody mentioned something. I don't know if he brought it up already. Uh, there was an, an issue with, uh, what quiz was it, Cody? Quiz two? Uh, chapter one. Chapter one. Chapter one. What was the, what I can was stay the on. I can stay on and ask you. It's about an, an incorrect answer, oh. but I don't want to give away the answer. So I'll just stay okay. on after this and explain. Yes, you can stay on and I can uh, adjust it. Yeah. And if any time that you guys see, uh, a typo or an incorrect answer uh, on the quizzes, please let me know. That's very helpful so that I can update it for the next the next year or the next semester. So thank you, Cody. Okay, anyone else? Um, for the blog post about Wanda's talk, uh, what day slash time is that due? Um, let's see, the blog entry, I don't, Emily, do I have a due date on that particular blog entry? Do you know? Let me take a look. Usually when I make the assignment, I will add a, a, a due date. So I will go ahead and do that now. Um, I want right to now. give you guys a couple of days to work on it. So I will make it due, I'll make it due on Tuesday. So, let's see, the 8th. So if you're gonna write about that, it will be due on the 8th at midnight. So I'm actually updating that due date right now. Okay, will that give you enough time? Okay, good. All right, any other questions? Okay, so that particular assignment now has a due date. 
So again, I will talk about the blog entries. Um, you will end up with maybe 10 choices throughout the semester, uh, but you need to write at least five blog entries. Of course, you're, you can write more than that, uh, but you will receive a grade for five of them, okay? Okay, well, it's 1217, so I'm gonna go ahead and let you guys go. Uh, graduate students, if you all can stay on, then we will talk about our research paper, talk, our, our research paper. And I will see the rest of you next week. Y'all have a safe weekend. Stay dry, stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay, well, hello, how's it going? Good. Y'all doing okay? Have y'all been able, did you guys try to access the articles that we talked about on Tuesday? Not um, yet? Able to see the, I can't remember the name of it, the Facebook thing that you, you have where it like pulls your post, what's it called? You guys know what I'm talking about? <laughs> yes, so you were able to see those? Yes, but okay, I, I, I wasn't And then you guys will have to, uh, I think if you put in a keyword, for your publication, then you'll be able to see just the ones that you're interested in. Have y'all tried to do that yet? Yeah, there's another way to drill down even further to look at a specific subset. Where's, so Hannah is not here today. I just noticed that. Okay, so um, we'll wait and talk about it again next Tuesday. Um, okay. and I, because I wanna make sure that we we're all on the same page. So we'll wait for Hannah. Um, but the next step is, um, Emily, can you set up a Qualtrics form with the themes that we talked about, uh, me, you, and David? Uh, yes, I yeah. have already started it, and so I'll just make sure to finish that up and send okay. that to everyone. Okay, that'll be great. Um, and then we can maybe start coding, not next week, but week after next. Um, okay. Just to clarify, did you want us to go ahead and start researching and pulling those samples? Yes, okay. yes. That way you'll be ready to go once we, we've completed the code book. Uh, we will, the first time we will actually code together to make sure we're on the same page. So uh, right now I want you guys to work on um, just getting your particular publication, getting your sample. Great. And I, I actually downloaded everything. So I will have everyone's sample. Uh, but it took forever to download and it made my um, computer crash because <laughs> it's just so much. So I'll have all four publications, uh, but you guys only need your individual publication. And when you download it, it'll download it as a CVS file. Um, let me see if I can find it and I'll show you guys how it looks. But it's, it's awesome. This will actually revolutionize how we're doing this type of research Emily can speak to that. It's been so hard previously to get a sample, uh, but using this particular app, uh, it downloads the full sample for you and it's, it actually puts it in a spreadsheet. Uh, so it's gonna make our research a lot easier. Um, I think it, well, it downloaded as a, is it, what is that called, CV something? What is that document? It's kind of like text. Oh yeah. CV. Uh, it's CSV not, or something. What is it? Is it CVV? Two Vs? Oh, maybe that one. Uh, gosh. I'm trying, to, trying to look in my downloads. I may have deleted it because it, it's a huge document, um, oh. like I said. And, and so it, it did make my, my system crash. Um, there it is. It's CSV. Okay, so when I downloaded the information, um, it down, it's, it's called historical. It's a historical report. Um, and so it broke it up into three sec separate documents uh, and they're all 188.9 megabytes. Uh, let me see if it'll let me open one.
See, it's so big, it's not even, I don't think it's going to let me open it. But anyway, um, it will be, the information is in a spreadsheet. It has the date that the item was posted. It has a, a URL that you can click to go directly to the item. It has the summary. It actually has the text that was posted on the Facebook page. Um, it has, the, if there's an image, it tells you that there was an image that's associated with it. Um, so it has all of that information. So when we get ready to code, that's gonna make our lives a lot easier. Okay. So maybe, let me see if I can go to the page. And what's the name of that? What is the name of the service again or the app? Always oh, Crowd Tangle. Quite Crowd Tangle, okay. Can you all see my screen? Okay. Okay. So COVID-19. Um, so here you can either look at all posts or you can look at posts with photos, posts with links, statuses, all videos, all Facebook videos, Facebook non-live, Facebook live, YouTube video. So I chose all posts um, for now. Um, and then for the choices, you can look at the last 30 minutes or custom. Um, and then you can look at some that overperforming, underperforming, or total interactions. Those are the different choices. So let's just take a look at the last 30 minutes. And down, okay, yeah, so this is where you can download it. Download CSV. And once you click download, it'll actually send it to your email. Um, and so here for you guys, I guess maybe if you put in like Breitbart, for example, I'm trying to see how we can just do one publication and not all of the publications. Have you guys been able to figure that out? I haven't. I've looked at mine, but... I guess you guys might have to set up a separate, set up your own, actually set up your own and just do your own individual publication. Right. Don't do all four. And so if you just put in one for your saved search or for your list, actually create a list. And then for your list, just put in your one publication. Does that make sense? Okay. And then that'll give you the content that you're looking for. And then once you get it, uh, the sample, then you would just do download CSV. Uh, and let me see if it's already emailed it to me. I have not. It takes a while. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but the email is kind of slow right now, I guess because of the weather. Uh, so it'll take a while to email it to me. Um, but we'll take a look at the CSV file next week and maybe Hannah will actually be with us and we can take a look at what's offered and then talk about how we want to approach our study. Okay. Do you guys have any questions? Nope, not on my end. Okay. And we'll later on, we'll also get you all to help with uh, with our introduction and with our literature review, because that's another part of our paper. So we'll, we'll divide that up as well and decide who's going to contribute what to the introduction and to the literature review. Okay. All right. All right. You guys have a good weekend and I will see you on Tuesday. Thank you. Thank you. I, I still have the question for the, oh, oh, the okay. quiz real quick. Okay. Just um, so I took chapter one yesterday and missed the true or false question about the Nielsen ratings. Um, it says on the quiz on, I think it's question three. Mm -hmm. um, it's a true or false about, I'm going to pull the question up so I know I'm reading it.
Okay. It says the media consumption figures from Nielsen in your text reveal that smartphones rule pervasively and continue to have the largest reach among new media. Uh -huh. uh, I put I put false okay. um, only because I remember the textbook saying it, it talked a lot about television. And I don't know if I, I misinterpreted it. And then I looked back at the textbook and the part where I, it talked about Nielsen ratings. It talked about television, radio, music CDs, internet, smartphones, and other print media. Was there a separate part that I d didn't recall that it know. said smartphones were? They, this, is, this quiz is actually provided by the publisher. Um, I will go back and check this particular question. Um, and also, I don't know if it's in the newer edition. Do you still have uh, the two, uh, a second edition? I have, yeah, the other second edition. So I don't know if it's an update. So I actually have both books, but I'll go back and I'll check this. And I'll, and if I have, if I see that a lot of students missed it, uh, then I will, of course, uh, you know, I'll have a curve and, and I will give you credit for it. Okay, yeah, uh, it's on. To my attention. Yeah, no, no, no worries. It's on p the top of page four for the second edition. Okay. talking about Nielsen, which, and I was conflicted because in my head, I knew that smartphones are the new way, but I was also like, well, the book told me TV as of, you know, that publication date that it was, uh, you know, television. And so that's why I ended up was like, well, I'll put false. And then I, that was the only question I got wrong. So. Okay. Uh, yeah. You made a 90. So that's good. I'm look. this is actually your quiz. That I, can you see it on the screen? Mm -hmm. So I actually pulled up your quiz. Um, so I will take a look as soon as we get off. I'll take a look at question three and see if I need to uh, modify it. Okay. Okay. Thank Sounds you for great. bringing that to my attention, Cody. Oh, no worries. I, I learned to ask questions in case things were a little confusing. Uh, during my summer class, I ended up getting, I think, 10 or 12 points added back because a couple of them either were missed interpreted or asked a weird way or the uh, system accidentally counted my response wrong. So yes. I always make sure and ask. That's good. When you're dealing with technology, uh, it doesn't hurt to ask. And of course, For professors sure. are human, so we can make mistakes. <laughs> awesome. Well, I well, thank you so that. much. All right. Thanks, Cody. Have a good All right. Thanks. Stay See you next. Great. I will. Okay. Bye-bye.